Yeah, okay. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you attendees. Thank you panelists. I'm just going to hop right into the discussion. Um, so uh, this panel is about how to get published. Um, we're all here interested in the publishing process, but uh, I'd like to ask uh, if you can tell us a little bit about your role. So we'll start with Rebecca. Okay, um, so in terms of how to get published, um, yeah, uh, I came into this industry uh, as an independent author. I just came up with this idea of a girl who was running away from her engagement party, stowed away about aboard an airship and uh, kind of convinced the pirates that attacked the ship to let her be one of the crew. And um, yeah, I self-published my first novella in 2014. Um, I completed this series, uh, Quartet of Novellas, in 2018, um, and somewhere around 2017, as I started to become um, a bit more involved in the professional side of publishing, uh, I started uh, aiming more towards like a bit of a hybrid career. So um, I've also had my work published in uh, various mediums like Tor.com, a number of poetry uh, submissions into various zines. Um, and then now I'm currently working on my first full length novel, uh, Slipstream book. And I got one of those big fancy Canada Council grants to support the work. So uh, yeah, <laughs> um, it's been a, a really interesting, what now, six year journey um, from publishing my first book to now where I am uh, a full-time writer and work part-time at the Word on the Street Toronto Literary Festival. Uh, and so I'm happy to, I'm really excited to chat with you all again. Um, and I'm really excited for your questions and not just in terms of like how to get published, but also like, what do you do if you want to build yourself up to a point where like you're a very good bet for a publisher and also how to ensure that, you know, publishing is a financially viable option for you. So like, make sure you ask questions about taxes and stuff in the Q&A portion. I love that. Uh, Tally, how about you? So I kind of, I wear two hats in the publishing world. So I'm the founder and publisher of the Soapbox Press, which is an independent press that focuses all on um, providing a space for emerging writers. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, I'm the, I'm the editorial assistant at Coach House Books, which is a very well-established press. So I started the Soapbox in 2016, um, and Coach House has been around since the 60s. Um, but yeah, throughout the panel, I'm excited to learn from all of you and also share the insights that I know, uh, or that I have rather. I'm still at the early stages of my career, so yeah. And Zalika. Yeah, um, so my book was published last year in June in 2019. I was published by Anansi. And um, my journey to getting published by Anansi is a little, it's a little, uh, it's not very straightforward because uh, my, my book is a short story collection. And the one thing you hear all the time is that nobody will sign short story collections because nobody will pay uh, to read short story collections. And so, um, so yeah, so for the longest time, it was just like a lot of rejections for me. And um, and that was when I was trying to find an agent. And so I just decided to submit to publishers myself. And it was after I submitted to certain publishers, um, smaller independent publishers that I got an agent. So I actually kind of had to do it in reverse, kind of what Rebecca was saying in terms of like, you know, making yourself um, seen as, 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 as someone to bet on. I, I kind of had to do that before I was able to get an agent to, to kind of like do the things for me that I didn't really know how to ask. So um, throughout the panel, I'll be happy to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and uh, next to writing, I also work for an organization called Diaspora Dialogues, which is, uh, and I run the mentorship programs there. So it's um, various mentorship programs for um, emerging writers, um, people of color, LGBTQ, um, we're really focused on kind of diversifying what it means to have what can look really means. And so my job is to kind of help emerging writers. And that's the, that's the other thing that I do. 
Thanks. So my next question, you've kind of all already touched on this already, but if you want to provide more detail, you can. It's just how did you get into the publishing industry? Um, so I guess for Tally, like how you became like the like the owner of a, of a press and how you became an editorial assistant and things like that. Yeah, so I'll start with the press. So I think my journey in publishing started at U of T. So during the first two years of my undergrad, I was part of a number of journals. Um, I was part of the Goose Journal at Victoria College and the Hate Teach Magazine at Victoria College. Um, and after two years of doing my own writing and also being part of journals, I just felt like there weren't enough places that focus specifically on elevating emerging writers and kind of eliminating the barriers that exist. And perhaps naively, I thought that I could help create that space. <laughs> and so I just took it upon myself to create it, um, built or found a team of like-minded people who also by coincidence happened to be U of T students as well. And since then we have been publishing creative writing anthologies, poetry chat books, and we recently started publishing full length works. And in addition to that, we host a lot of networking events, mentorship events, um, basically doing whatever we can to connect emerging writers to already established authors and publishing professionals in the field. And how did I land my editorial assistant job at Coach House Books? Also a bit of a long story, but I'll try to keep it short. In the fourth year of my undergrad, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, but I knew that I loved books and I loved publishing through my work with the Soapbox especially. And so I started attending many, many networking events. Um, and kind of through meeting one person to another, I ended up meeting Alana Wilcox, who is the editorial director at Coach House Books. And um, before starting my master's, I knew that there would be a practicum component there. And so I asked her to meet for coffee to learn all that I could about Coach House. And I mentioned that I would have a practicum placement. Um, and I asked if there would be a space or an opportunity for me to possibly do it there. And she just told me to check back in. So six months later, when it was time to find a placement, I reached out to her and she very kindly took me on. I did my practicum placement with Coach House. And then a couple of months later, she reached out and asked if I had found a job yet, and I had not. And so I have been with Coach House ever since. That's great. Coach House is very, um, very present here in, uh, in Canadian literature. Uh, and I also, like, I also was published in The Goose when I was at U of T. So it was like great to know that you're also an editor there. Um, Zalika and Rebecca, do you want to talk about your work with um, Word on the Street and Diaspora Dialogues? Uh, sure. So it's interesting. Um, so how I came became involved with Diaspora Dialogues is um, so at U of T when I was in my undergrad, I was also taking creative writing courses at the School of Continuing Studies and um, uh, instructor there really liked my work. And she was like, you know, there's this place that's called Diaspora Dialogues. I think that you should like try to get a mentorship there. I think it would work for you. And I was like, great. Um, so I applied and I got in and Diaspora Dialogues at the time and still now was all about, yeah, like, you know, um, we're all about community. So, so like, you know, just email us if you have any questions or if you want to know anything about publishing. And I got into the Diaspora Dialogues mentorship when I was in my last year at U of T and I was going away to Columbia for my MFA. Um, so I left, um, I didn't stay in New York because it was extremely expensive. I came back, uh, I couldn't really find a job anywhere. So I was working at the Gap for a while. And I was just like, one day I'm like, I'm just gonna just email a whole bunch of people and ask if they know of any jobs in uh, the publishing or creative writing field because I can't work at the Gap anymore. And so I emailed um, who who's now my predecessor and I was just kind of like, yeah, you know, like I was a mentor, like three or four years ago and you guys mentioned that you're always about community so do you know of any jobs anywhere um it could be part-time it could be contract and then uh, my predecessor was like actually I'm leaving this position would you be interested in like having an interview for it and I was like great and then that's sort of how that happened um and so that's how I became involved with DD. yeah I love that I am like uh I'm actually from, I went to school at the University of Ottawa so, um, and I studied political science and women's studies there. So uh, as you can see, my, my line of career is completely complementary to what I studied. Um, it actually is like, it's a, a poli sci degree is actually brilliant for world building because you get right into like the nitty gritty of like how societies form 
um, all the things that can make them fall apart, which is really fun for writing. Um, yeah, I graduated uh, from Ottawa uh, and then I bounced around for a bit because graduating shortly after a recession sucks. Tip to the wise, your transferable skills are yours. <laughs> um, and I actually ended up getting a job as a media analyst at uh, Queen's Park. And so um, I was working on the steampunk series and my, my, my part-time job was going in at 6 p.m. at night and transcribing all of the news stories uh, so that the politicians could read them. Um, and I bounced around there for a bit. I ended up at MTO in a really nice gig as a communications coordinator. Um, and then I left in 2018 because, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I was kind of in a place where I had finished my first series. I really wanted to be an author. Um, I knew that I could do it um, and that I had really good ideas. I had started meeting with um, different agents and editors and was like, okay, I'm like my next book, I'm going to submit it to people. But in the meantime, I've got to get it out of this bureaucrat life. And, and I don't, I want to like commit to this fully. And so I started applying around to different places and didn't get a single interview. And then um, the word on the street had a position open and I, they were not expecting me, but it's great. Um, I can work there part time. Um, I absolutely adore that team. Um, it's super fun to work with them and it's a bunch of people that would love to like, you know, trans, like we really see our role as amplifiers and the, the transformative potential of literature and um, especially now, especially in these days. Uh, so that's really exciting and it's exciting to, you know, be part of something where when I started out, I was just hawking my books in the marketplace, uh, you know, like these little novellas for 10 bucks a pop and I uh, dress up in my little steampunk costumes. Um, and now to work at the organization um, where, you know, we feature like Zalika's panels and everything every year. Um, we had Therese as a guest. I'm sure we'll have Tally as a guest. Like it, it brought me into seeing Canlet as a community that wasn't like this, you know, monolith thing that existed and you have to like knock on the gate and you come in. It's like giving me such a different perspective of the literary community in this city um, and this country as like something that is always evolving, rapidly changing and that everyone has a different definition of. Um, and you kind of see that from the top down of all these different genres and communities that have their own circles and networks. Um, but then like when you're in it, it just feels like one big awesome network. That's certainly true. And that's been my experience as well. Um, so now we're going to just get a little bit more into uh, like the uh, panel proper. Uh, so my next question for you is for all of you is, what are the questions that authors should ask themselves before uh, seeking publication or like what things should they research? Uh, I'll start with Zalika. Um, in terms of like what you should research, obviously you should research um, which publishing house you want to, if you want to go the route of uh, going through like a traditional publisher, which publisher would um, work for you and which agent would work for you as well. Um, so for me, uh, I knew that, and sometimes people don't want to go through an agent. Sometimes people want to just deal with the publishers themselves because for their various reasons, I knew that I wanted an agent because I knew that I didn't know what I like, what to ask. And there have been many times when I've been in meetings and I've been like, oh yeah, that's great. And then my agent will be like, actually. And so I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know that that was something that I had to ask. So it's been very helpful for me. And how I found my agent was actually just by Google. Um, and I had my short story collection, but I'm also working on a fantasy young adult novel. So I knew that I had to find someone who was, uh, who was interested in both the quote unquote literary fiction and YA fiction and genre fiction and knew how to do both. And, um, and when I was doing my MFA, uh, one of my mentors said something that really stuck with me. It's like, when you do go with agents, 
you're also interviewing them. Like they want to see if that you're going to be taking on a client, but you're also seeing if you want to like employ them. So, you know, ask them what their plan is, ask them what they think of your book, ask them where they think your book is going to go. Um, so I asked all of those questions and she and I really hit it off. And so, so that kind of just how, that's how that relationship built. But it was also very interesting because I was, um, since I had already spoken to a few publishers on my own, there was a particular publisher that I was really interested in publishing with because I really wanted to publish with this editor, but, but she was just kind of like, I think you should just kind of research and like speak to the authors who have been with this publisher a little bit more just to see if this is really what you wanted to do. So something that I learned from her and something that I do encourage authors to do is I think that it's totally okay if you reach out to authors and ask them about their publishing experiences with a particular publisher that you're interested in and to get their side of the story if they're willing to um, if they're willing to communicate that because that was also very helpful for me. Um, so, so that's something that for me who wanted to go through a traditional publisher and wanted an agent and wanted those things, um, that's kind of just how I kind of went about it where I was just kind of like, okay, um, I know that I want my book to be published because that was like my main thing. My main thing was like, I just want my book to be published um, from a traditional publisher. It can be an indie press. I don't really expect like Penguin to, to want this. It's, it's totally fine. Um, and my agent was the one who was like, you know, I see this book going places and she was very encouraging. And so she told me what her plan for my book was and that was very inspiring. And so that's how I decided to quit my agent. You're muted, Therese. <laughs> Sorry, um, uh, Tally. What about you? What's uh, um, what are questions like writers should ask themselves or research before getting a publisher? This is such a great question. I think my answer is very similar to Zalika's, and that what I would encourage writers to ask is what their goal is from the book that they want to publish. So why are you publishing? Is your goal just because you wrote this book that you really, really love and you want just to put it out in the world and you want your friends and family to have a copy? Do you want it to be published with a major publisher and be, you know, sell a hundred thousand copies and are you trying to make a million dollars, which is never a great goal when you're publishing. You should, but anyways, that's a different conversation. Um, or are you interested in having control in all aspects of your work and kind of do you want to know what the cover is going to look like in the layout and do you want to be your own editor or to hire your own editor and kind of be able to control the nitty gritty and if that's the case then maybe self-publishing is what you want and then also finding the right fit with the publishing houses that you're submitting to so all of that is to say um, and again to echo Zalika is really to know why you want to publish and then once you know what your goal is then you'll also know where you want to publish and what publishers you may want to approach, or if you want to go through the self-publishing route, which I think Rebecca can speak to um, really well, is then you will know what steps you should take and how to go from there. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, yeah, can you talk a little bit about, you know, um, authors who want to go about self-publishing their work and the kinds of questions that they also need to ask themselves? Mm -hmm. Well, like my first, uh, I was jotting down notes, and my first one was literally what Tally just said, like, are you looking at this as a career, like a writing career that you're stepping into? Are you looking at this as like, you know, one book that you really just want to go out there with, um, like Zalika was talking about, although I hope that Zalika writes more. Um, okay. Or like, is it for like, are you looking to like make a living from this? Are you looking at this to be kind of like a side gig um, or your main income? Like you basically have to like, really ask yourself like why you're doing this like what is it that you're trying to say is this like a lifelong thing or is this like a uh an, a, a checkbox like an accomplishment that you want to have but then you will go forward and do other things like is this your main goal or is this like a side quest you know um you know you still have to save the princess in breath of the wild but uh the side quests are really fun so yeah, is this your Princess Zelda or is this your, you know, Hyrulean shield? Like you gotta, you gotta answer that for yourself. Um, the other thing that I would recommend is asking yourself what your strengths are. You know, is it, is writing your strength? Is editing your strength or taking feedback from editors? Uh, because that is a strength of being able to incorporate that into your work. 
Um, are you really good at connecting with people and distributing things and shipping? And you love like the, the logistics and the analytics of stuff. Um, marketing, like, do you love marketing? I'm really good at marketing and it, it shows in my, in my books and the way that my career has gone. But that's a skill that I have that not everyone does have. Um, design, are you really good at designing covers, at designing marketing materials, at making your book look as professional or more professional than the average book out there? Because when you're coming at things as a self-published author, the threshold for your legitimacy is higher than a traditionally published book. Because the traditionally published books they come with the legitimacy of the publisher backing them who has already vetted and you know you would assume has like put a lot of more work into it when you're coming in as a self-published author the threshold like the bar for you being taken seriously is much much higher and you kind of have to step up to that um and then uh yeah like you're writing like are you are you a strong writer or do you have a story to tell and you might need some work with the writing all of these things are going to kind of you know, feed into like a very personal decision on which option you're going to go to go through. Um, in the beginning of my career, I, I wanted to see if I could do it. Um, and I didn't want anyone to tell me no, because I, I was too afraid to hear that as an answer. And so I just kind of like snuck it into the internet, my little like 100 page novella, and was like, oh, I did it. Yay. And I was like half terrified that someone was going to read it and half terrified that no one was ever going to read it. Um, but it's sold over a thousand print copies now. It's in the Merrill SF collection. Um, I've finished it up with four books. I ha have fans that come for hours, like to, you know, whenever there's like a new book out and stuff. Like it's hard to, it's hard to go back to that person I was back in 2014 who just like hit publish and immediately had an anxiety attack. But like, that's the reality is that I did it basically as a dare to myself to do it. Now, when I'm approaching the books, now uh, with like, you know, six years experience as an independent author, I know the parts that I'm good at and I know the parts that I hate. And the shipping and logistics is one of them. Um, the accounting, freaking, I mean, like, I like doing the taxes part because I was really bad at it. And so I got really good at it, but I hate distribution. Um, I'm like eh, on like the design um, and I love getting feedback from editors, but I, I hate going through and doing line edits myself. And so all of these things point to me being like, oh, I need to work with a publisher. I would love to have a publisher and an agent handle those parts of things and it's okay that traditional publishers aren't necessarily all the best at the marketing side of things, which is something that a lot of authors, um, traditional and independent, often learn the hard way that, you know, if you are one of like 20 books in a publisher's catalog, they are not going to be like giving you the world tour for your book. If you are one of 20 in their catalog, like if you want the world tour, you are going to have to probably do it yourself. Um, and so the marketing thing in particular, like, I think is a strength that you kind of have to have, whether you're deciding to go independent or traditional, like if it's not a strength for you, like me and my taxes, like you need to work on it and be conscious that like, that is a, that is a piece of the puzzle that you kind of have to bring to the table. Mm. That's all really, that's really good advice. Um, really good questions that we need to ask. Now, I'm, I want to talk more about um, sort of like the actual process of a publishing. Um, so I will, so my questions is like, what are, what are, what, what, like from acquisitions to print, like what, like, what's that process like? You know, you, you have, you're a writer, you submitted your book to the publisher or your agent submitted your book to the publisher and they said yes. And now what happens now? So I'll start with Zalika. Um, so one thing that I actually had to learn is that publishing is very much hurry up and wait. So there's like <laughs> this a lot of, we have to get it in, we have to do this. And my agent did something where she like gave publishers like a deadline, like to, to be like, okay, you have three weeks to, to make an offer and 
you know, she was trying to do like a whole bunch of like a bidding war and type of thing. And I was like, really? For this? Okay. <laughs> um, it was like super bizarre to me because I was like, it's not like an Avengers movie, but anyway. Um, and then I got my, uh, I, and so there was like all of this thing and like, oh yeah, do you really like this contract? Do you like this? And like all of the tagline. And then I didn't hear anything for like four months. And I was just like, oh, okay. Like, I don't, I don't really know what's happening now. And then the new year started. And um, so then I, I got to meet, so, um, and Nancy actually hired a freelance editor to work with me. And so the first thing that actually happened was that I sat down with her for dinner and like, we just talked about my book and we just talked about whether we were on the same page and just, you know, what she had in mind, um, because these are substantive edits. These aren't line edits. These are like, you know, restructuring and content and, and things like that. So it's very important that your editor and you are on the same page. Otherwise, you might come out with a book that you don't want. Um, so we had a very long conversation about that. And um, at the time, my collection was quite short um, because I'm a very compact writer. And so another thing that I learned was that word count, like, matters it like matters way more than I thought that it would matter originally my um collection was like 23,000 words and when Nancy had first read it they were just like oh this is great where's the rest and I was like no that's the whole thing and they were like you need to write more stories we need you to get at least to 50 to 55,000 words and I think I got to around 43 and I was like, okay, that's it. Like there's nothing else that I want to do. Um, but one story in particular, I kind of just added in for padding because I was just like, they want words and I'm giving them words. And I really hated that story because I was just like, this isn't my best work. And I just did it because um, you guys kept talking to me about word counts. And my editor and I were like, okay, well, we're going to actually make this into a story that you like. So I kind of wrote a new story while I was in the editing process. Um, but everything else, because I had been working on my collection at that point for like, I, for like eight to 10 years, um, and I had gone over it and over it and over it. And I had gone to different residencies and spoken to different mentors and like had all of these different, um, people look at it. It was already very polished. So my editing process actually didn't take that long. Um, I know people where their editing process can take like a year or two years or something like that, um, which is kind of an extreme example, but it can also happen. And it also depends on the publishing house uh, that you're with and how many books your editor is editing at the time. Um, but I did mine in a couple of months. And that was also just because um, I was very dedicated to getting the editing done quickly. So like I would do things that fortunately my job would allow where I would take like three or four days off work so I could like stay home and just edit my stuff and like send it back. Um, but then just because I was done editing it doesn't mean that like I get it back in the same time. So I would have to wait. So it was like that very much like I'm hurrying up, I'm doing everything and it's very perfect. And then I have to wait. And so the waiting was very difficult for me because it's like, you know, my first book and I'm very anxious about it. I want to make sure everything's okay. And uh, the, there wasn't, there was communication when communication was necessary, but it's not like they're talking to you every day. And um, so I was kind of nervous and like annoying the hell out of my agent, just being like, I don't know, like, do you think everything is okay? But my agent was very understanding. Um, so then after the substantive edit, edits, 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 um, comes the, the line edits. And um, that's a different editor. And that's just basically like, you know, grammar, comma, making sure that it fits like the Nancy or the publisher um, kind of tone and style, like in terms of just, do you use an Oxford comma or you don't use an Oxford comma, like that kind of thing. Um, my, for me in particular, because I had a lot of specific cultural elements to my story, I had to kind of go back and forth with my line editor about certain things that weren't technically grammatically correct, but were right for the story. So I'd be like, no, this is what I mean. And this is why I mean it. And this is why it has to stay this way. And so that kind of happened. And um, after that, you get like your galleys. So you can just like read them kind of like as like a manuscript. And there's also like the PDF version of that. And, and then basically, uh, 
when that's all done, you sign off and then you have to wait till it gets published. I'm sure there are a lot of things that I am like missing <laughs> and I'm sure Tally can like talk about that. But from what I remember of the editing process and of like the acquisition and everything like that, um, that's what I remember. And then there's also a meeting um, cause you know, you, your book cover is revealed and even, I was very fortunate in the sense that um, my publisher, like at first before they showed me my book cover was like, what kind of thing do you want your, like give me like some kind of like images that you think should be on the book cover. They didn't take any of my suggestions but at least they asked. Um, and so then, yeah. So then after that, like the book cover was revealed and I had to sit down and have a conversation about marketing and about, um, the certain things that I'd be willing to do. They asked me, are you good with social media? Are you good with interviews? Are you good? Like, what are you good at doing? Um, and so I was actually very fortunate in the sense that I had great marketing. I had a very good publicist, um, which I know isn't always uh, what happens, but, um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I remember about that sort of timeline with, uh, with my publisher. Oh. No worries. Thanks for that. Tell me, what is Zalika missing from <laughs> that that process? Oh my god. Well, from the perspective of an editor, uh, from uh, from the perspective of a writer, I think that covers it. But from the perspective of a publisher, it's like the behind the scenes machine that's like doing all of the other things. So, whew. Well, like there's the contracts and the admin side. Then there's the marketing side. So you have to plan the marketing strategy. There's all of your like the distribution teams that you have to talk to there's kind of okay well sorry my head is a mess of things because there's so many components but the biggest thing to keep in mind with publishing is that it works in seasons and so often you're working at least a year in advance and so you're working with the cycle of the publishing world that operates a year in advance but also because often publishers are very understaffed everyone is doing a million things and everyone is both doing a lot very quickly, but also waiting on a lot of other people. So hurry up and wait is really, really accurate, which is why the timelines with publishing are all over the place and everything takes so long because there's a lot of hands, but not enough hands doing many things. And I'm not answering anything specifically, which is a little bit useless, but <laughs> to keep it very, very broad um, from the publishing side, what the publishers are doing is in addition to communicating with all of the writers that they're working with and assigning editors to work on each project, making sure that the editorial is on track and then getting it into production, um, getting the book laid out, coordinating with the cover designer and getting a cover for the book, which sometimes works out really easily. And I've learned that some publishers are great and they consult with their authors. Like at the Soapbox, we always consult with our authors. We make sure that our authors love the cover that is on their book. Um, but other publishers, sometimes they don't consult their authors at all and they just send their author a cover and they say, this is what's gonna sell copies. This is what you're getting. And it's the end of discussion. <laughs> Luckily, that's not the case with Coach House either, but that is the case with some publishers. Um, then there is the proofreading of the book, making sure that there's no mistakes once everything is laid out and completed, then you have to print the book, then you have to send it to your distributors and that's all before the book goes on sale and you actually have to start selling it. And then, well, then you have to go back and all of the work that goes into marketing, it, marketing the book even before the book is done. So anyways, it's, it's a lot, it is an endless cycle, but it is a great cycle that could definitely use some streamlining, but there's a lot that happens. We, uh, us book lovers, really appreciate all the work that you do to ensure that books get to us. Um, so, um, Rebecca, yeah, I just wanted to know, um, like, say I'm an author and I have decided that I'm going to go the self-publishing route. So what is, what is my process for self-publishing a book? Well, the first thing that you want to do is research the different um, platforms. When I first started out, there was uh, like CreateSpace had yet to be uh, subsumed by the KDP uh, publishing under Amazon. Uh, Kobo has a self-publishing platform. Uh, Smashwords will let you do it on a number of different platforms, including like iBooks and uh, things like that. I think Smashwords might be the one as well where um, you can also get distribution into some bookstores and libraries. And so, yeah, so being mindful ar around um, 
the ideas where so like there's uh what two of the main discourses around self-publishing is like um being amazon exclusive or publishing wide um i think most people are choosing to publish wide these days there are fancy things that amazon will let you do if you agree to only let your books be available on their platform but i don't recommend that um especially in canada where um, if you want your books to be available in like our library system, for example, uh, in the overdrive system, um, you need to go with something else. Uh, so yeah, so do your research into what the current platforms are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, where you would get distribution, um, that kind of thing. Then you need to go in and download that platform's specific guidelines and requirements for formatting your manuscript. Um, my advice would be to, in whatever like format you have that you've written it in, whether you use uh, Scrivener or just like a Word document or Google Docs or anything like that, do your editing and everything, like the polishing and all of that in that format. Um, send it around to uh, whether you hire an editor or have a friend who's really good at editing and you know, beta readers, um, all great folks to reach out to, to help you polish the work and make sure it's in like as good shape as possible. And then go and follow the guidelines for formatting it for that platform. So you might even have to format it differently based on different platforms. Um, when I was first starting out, I, I would have like Google opened in one tab and the how to document in another tab. And like, I learned things about like Microsoft Word formatting that would like, like just shock and awe the entire time. It took me four days to make the blank page happen between the table of contents and the first chapter because there's a difference between a section break and a continuous section break that makes absolutely no sense to anyone except for the people that went to school for this kind of stuff like it's appalling how quirky some of these formatting things can be so you have to make sure that it's specific to whatever platform you're going on uh all right so that's like yeah for editing and polishing um getting it onto that platform usually at this stage in the process um like I would already have a cover. Um, my sister painted all of the, the artwork for my covers. And I had a, a friend who did uh, posters, concert posters, um, who designed my, my book covers for me. Uh, and it was really fun working with them. And we had a really great system going. So, um, so the cover design was, uh, it was very simple. Make sure you have at least five people read over your back cover blurb. That is a very important part. Make sure that there's like no spelling errors, make sure that it's catchy, make sure like tell someone who hasn't read your book before to read the, the back blurb and tell you what they think the book is about because that can be really instructive. And when you've been working on a book for so long, which it could have been, you could have written it in a few months or it could have taken you 10 years to write and you are just, no matter what timeline it is, you are too close to your own work to view it objectively. And I think that that's where like um, working with a publisher can be really beneficial because they have a marketing team um, and a design team that are like experts at understanding at like having a bit of distance from the work and being able to market it effectively. Um, so getting feedback from folks at every stage of this process is really important. Um, then you pick a publishing date. I would usually pick something that was a month out from the point that I was ready. Um, I would build out like a little pre-order campaign. I would do some research into um, bookstagrammers or booktubers uh, that might be interested in my work and who accept submissions from self-published authors because not everyone does. Um, and I would create the cutest little book boxes. Like I had like teal crinkle paper and bookmarks and I had like a, a wax seal stamp thing. And so I would make these book unboxing experiences and I would ship them out to um, a few different bloggers uh, and also like an, an extra copy that they could then give away to their followers. Um, so different things like that. 
So like you're developing the marketing strategy, you want to be doing this at least a month out. You have to let all of your readers know about like what's um, that the book is going to be coming out. Um, having a newsletter is a great avenue for that. Um, having some kind of social media presence. You don't need to be on every platform, but whichever one works the best for you, the one that you're, you enjoy doing the most, for me, it's Instagram. Um, but whatever one you enjoy the most, like make that kind of like your home base and like be visibly excited about your work in that space. You know, none of this coy little like, oh yeah, I wrote a book, yes, it's, it's okay. Like that, that, that's cute for like the first book and it's cute only for the first like two and a half months. All right. Like there's a point and I'm looking at you, I'm looking directly at you, Therese. Um, <laughs> no, there is a point where you need to go from like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening to me to like, I have worked really hard on this and I am very excited about it and I love what I'm doing. And making that transition, I think is extra hard for emerging authors and self-published authors because like you're, you're still waiting for someone to come and wave the magic wand of legitimacy where like, they're like, boom, you're an author now, you, you belong here. Um, so like no one's going to do that and you have to begin to take yourself really seriously and you have to be like, visibly excited and say like, yeah, I wrote a book about steampunk airship pirates and it's great. It's super fun. If you like this, this, and this, then you might like it. Um, if this isn't your jam, totally fine. Let me know if you know anyone who would love like a rollicking steampunk adventure that, yeah, my first book, 21,000 words, Zalika. I totally feel you. The other ones we ended up longer. Um, where was I? I got distracted. Um, yeah, so uh, about a month out, I would do all of that, um, begin marketing the book, send out review copies, uh, and plan a book launch date. Uh, for my last book, I was lucky enough to work with uh, Baca Phoenix Books um, because they are fantastic and they, they think I'm a real author now. <laughs> um, I am, I am. But uh, usually I would just book like a room at like my, uh, my local bar like I did it at Tequila Bookworm down on Queen Street, you know, rest in peace. Um, I did it at the Westerly, uh, which is also closed down. Bad luck, guys. Um, but yeah, I would book a room at a bar and I would invite all my friends and family. I would get a huge box shipped to me and I would do the unboxing live at the event and give my mom the first copy. And like, it was really fun. Oh, and then, yeah, I would tour around to like, the word on the street accepts independent authors as um, in their exhibitor marketplace. Uh, I did a lot of events with uh, Fan Expo and Comic-Con through my association with the Toronto Steampunk Society. Um, CanCon in Ottawa is great for if you're a science fiction fantasy like genre author, but just do research into your community, like different avenues where your, your books might find their ideal audience. Uh, craft fairs, fall fairs, anything like that, um, like local farmers markets through the summer, maybe like things where like you can distribute your books and you can also talk to like local independent bookstores about whether they'd be willing to take on your books, but you have to approach them each individually and sign a consignment agreement, which means that they will usually take at least 40% of the cover price. Uh, so you kind of have to work that into the cost of your book. Um, but with everything else, like you just get to keep all the money. So that part's nice. Oh, that works. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. Um, we have about like 15 minutes left until we break. So um, yeah, we'll just like keep these ones like really quick. So uh, my next question for you all is, um, I have two good questions. Hmm. Okay, so do you think that there's a pressure uh, on writers to publish books. So like, if you don't have a book, you're not, I know you talked about this a little bit, Rebecca, but um, like you, if you don't have a book, you're not really like a real author, you're not like legitimate or anything like that. Um, so start with Zalika. You're muted. <laughs> Just like if you call yourself a writer, but you don't have a book, then people are like, you're not really a writer because you don't have a book. 
Is that like, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Like, is there some sort of pressure? Like, is like, do you, do you feel like, like you as a, as a first time as an author, right? do you, did you feel like a pressure to write a book? I know you were in an MFA. And yeah. Like, I was that's, like, kind of the point. <laughs> that's kind of the point. Right. But like, yeah. Um, so it's actually kind of interesting because the MFA that I was in wasn't about publishing. It was about, um, you're mostly young and you're in New York city and you happen to be at an Ivy League, so kind of just be grateful that you're here um, and just kind of like write. Um, and I know that a lot of people that was in my program um, didn't like that approach uh, because they came to an MFA to be like, this is how you publish, this is how you uh, meet agents, this is how, but I had gone to an MFA to learn how to grow as a writer. So I was like, yeah, I am like, you know, in New York, in like, I, I'm like by myself for the first time in like my, my entire life. And like, I get to write like all day, like, this is amazing. So um, in that sense, I was just like, I don't really care that they're not teaching me how to get an agent. I just really want to know how to better my craft. Amongst the peers, though, there was definitely like, you know, this competition of who's going to publish where and who's going to do this when. And so um, in that sense, there was definitely like this building pressure of like, who is actually going to take something away from this MFA and like, actually like all of the money that you've spent and all of the time that you put into it are you actually going to be a writer like are you actually going to make good on this investment or are you just gonna go off and do something else so there was this kind of sense of just kind of like are you wasting time doing this um and for me for a while there was this kind of pressure of I need to get published like right away like I need to get published like right now because um a, I was sick of writing my book at that point. It had been like eight years and I was just kind of like, I don't want to do it anymore, man. Like, and I just, you know, and I think there was this kind of sense of validation um, just being like, yeah, like I, I, I wanted to feel validated and, and by having this book out, that's how I felt like I was going to be validated. And then nothing was really happening because I had submitted stuff to the States and in the States, they were like, this is very Canadian. I don't really know what to do with this. And um, in the UK, they were like, this is like really Jamaican. I don't know what to do with this. And so, you know, it got a little discouraging after a while. And, um, and so I kind of just abandoned my book for about a year and I started working on the YA that I'm working on right now. And, you know, there was this kind of like pressure of, did I just waste all of my time doing this? But then there gets to this certain point, at least for me, uh, where the validation didn't really matter anymore. It was just kind of like, I wrote this and I'm gonna send it out. And if these people don't like it, then they don't like it. And that's the worst that can happen. And I'll just continue, like I'll just continue to write. I don't really know exactly how that happened but I think like I've spoken to different artists and I've spoken to different writers and there just always seems to be this point where they're just like I don't really care anymore like I, I'm doing this because I like to do it and I think once you get to that point and once you really truly just like believe like yeah I'm a writer and this is what I'm doing um then your perspective changes and when your perspective changes I think your approach changes your attitude changes and that creates different results. And that's kind of what happened with me. Um, there isn't really like a scientific reason I can explain for this. I just know that that's kind of what happened. So um, when I got to that point, uh, the pressure was, wasn't kind of there. Um, and then when I actually got the publishing deal and then like, it was just kind of one of those things when I realized like when the book was in like Indigo or something, I'm like, oh my God, people are gonna read this. Like they're actually gonna read a book. Like they're like, my words are gonna, like I can't take anything back now. Um, and so I, you kind of have to just make peace with that as well. Like that this is your product and it's out there and people may or may not read it and people may or may not like it. Um, and, and there's different ways that you kind of like come to terms with that. Um, mine was just being like, but I did it. Like this is exactly what I wanted to do and I did it and it's out there. And I think my cousin took a picture of like her holding my book in like an aisle, like on the first day of publication. And I was just like, oh my God, this is exactly why I did this. This is amazing. Um, and so, so, so that's just kind of how that worked. I'm not sure if I really answered your question, Therese, but um, that's- Yeah, kind of yeah, it. you did feel a pressure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, 
There's just um, like one thing with that, that pressure and stuff like that, that I think is such a key point. Um, and especially if you're like, I wish we could see the audience, but um, especially if you're a student and especially if you're a younger writer who, um, or even just like an emerging writer at any age who hasn't yet developed that, that, that security in your identity as a, as a writer or an author or a poet, um, there's two points that I wanna make. Number one, a rising tide lifts all ships, all right? So like when you are in a cohort or a community with other writers, there is, there is a sense of competition occasionally, um, but you can choose whether you participate in that or not. Um, I think that one of the best things that can happen is to um, like either organically by reaching out to other people in your community or in a more structured way, whether like joining a, a writing workshop or going to, um, you know, a fancy seminar type thing. I don't know, classmates. I was, I'm a poli sci student, I'm sorry. Um, so whether you're running it in a structured way or in an organic way through your community, find a cohort. They are, they are going to be going through milestones around the same time as you. They are going to be your best source of advice um, and you want every single person around you to succeed because like they're going to motivate you. They're going to help you. They're going to help point out the sharp rocks in the water around you. Like when you go through this publishing world as a cohort, like you have um, so much more insulation against like the downfalls um, you can really hold together. So like, you know, the, the, the instinct of competition and who's going to get things first, like it's totally natural, but you have a choice of it, whether you opt into that or not. Um, the other thing is the idea of literary citizenship. Like, are you going to be a good literary citizen in this community? Um, and that means respecting your peers. It means, you know, when you, when you get like the green jealousy goblins, you talk about it to like your trusted friend offline over drinks and you ask them first like hey do you have the capacity for me to vent about this and be like a little jealous and petty and if they say yes great grab a beverage of your choice get into it for 45 minutes set a timer for it and then after the 45 minutes are done you have to say like five nice things about like something positive that you're really excited about um, because this industry is not fair it is not equal. There is like no guaranteed pathway. Um, and so like, especially as writers, we are both like the most powerful and critical parts of this and also the ones with the least power. And, um, you know, kind of like, you know, it, it, like it's so imbalanced. And so like with that in mind, like kind of having that kind of collective identity as authors and like really working to support each other it's something that I find really personally important and it really helps when you're struggling with that identity as like a writer or an author to be in a community where you call each other authors and writers all the time and you acknowledge that in them even when they're not acknowledging that in themselves yet. That's good. Um, I wanted to hear um, just before we break from Tally, uh, but like do, as, as a publisher and as an editor, do you feel that there is a pressure on writers uh, to, to publish books? Um, cause I come from it in two places. I want to say no, because I personally, like, I don't think a published book makes a writer a writer. I think a writer is a writer is a writer. If you write, then you are a writer. And exactly like Rebecca was saying, you have to own that title. Um, but as a writer myself who actively doesn't seek publication, I always hesitated before to call myself a writer because I didn't have a book. So can I say that the pressure doesn't exist? No, um, it's there. I think it's just, I don't know. When I approach the industry from the publishing side, I don't think of, I don't think about it that way, but everyone has <laughs> there. It, it really, oh, my laptop is falling. It all depends on who you ask. Yeah, I've talked to other writers and they were saying that like a book is like somewhat especially in certain communities, it's something of like, like a currency. It's like, you could like, oh, I'm, you have a book and I have a book. So like, we're the same because like we both have books. Um, yeah, so but I, could I have four books and a lot of those same people don't think that I am a real writer. 
Like, I swear, like, it's so funny going through candlelit circles versus like, like, I remember one weekend I was at Fan Expo um, as a guest. I had um, autograph sessions. Um, I had a signing line that was like 16 people deep and I didn't even have a new book out that year. You know, like I, like I had the fancy guest badge. I had handlers, like I had a bookstore selling my books, you know, like I, this is legit. There are photos of like me reading to this like little crowd of people at in like the big fan expo booths and stuff like but like I am like temporarily and situationally famous in that one specific environment and then I'd go to like the coach house wave goose and everyone like all they care about is that I work at work on the street and like it's so fundamentally There's different like in that world because I I'm just an indie author like there was no they they still wouldn't take me seriously so like you really have to take your work seriously because like you can have, i've published four books i am a relatively successful canadian author and there are still people that don't think that i'm like a real quote-unquote author so you have to claim that identity for yourself because like it is so arbitrary and other people's rules are silly yeah and i guess I, uh, sorry. sorry no go ahead go ahead go ahead I was just going to say um, to all of the writers in our audience, just to make sure that when you are giving your book or submitting it for publication, to make sure that you're putting it in the hands of somebody that will value your work, whether you have no books behind your name or 75 books behind your name and that they see you for you and for your work and not for, you know, the, as Rebecca said, the currency that you hold. Um, and I also come from a place where when I work with the soapbox, my favorite writers to work with are writers who have never published a book before and that were their first one. So um, just find a good home for your work and do your research and, you know, coming back full circle. Okay. Um, thank you to our panelists. I think we're going to have a little, a little break. Yes, Emily? Yes. Um, we are going to take a break till about 8.15. So during that time, if the audience would like to submit questions, um, we'll pile them all together and give them to Therese to ask our amazing panelists. Um, and if we don't get enough questions, we'll just keep going because the discussion has been really great. So yeah, I will see everybody back here at 8.15.
Okay, so it is 816. I think that we can come back. I hope everybody had a good break. Um, I'm just going to wait for all of our panelists and Therese to turn back on their camera. Perfect. So Therese, all of the questions are on the document. I've tried my hardest to uh, condense everybody's questions. Um, so I hope that I uh, kept the meaning of what you guys were asking. Um, so yes, I guess we can start. Okay, excellent. So we have some, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Uh, so yeah, we've got a couple of really good questions. So my, um, okay, so first question is, um, if any of you have any advice on publishing uh, like children's literature or like kid lit, if anyone knows, no, yes, maybe. Unfortunately, not yet. I'm still in the midst of doing my uh, young adult novel. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. No worries. Uh, Tally? Um, yeah, I don't work in children's book publishing, but just kind of the same advice I would always give across the board, no matter what genre, just really do your research, research the publishing houses that publish the specific type of children's literature that you are writing, um, and then submit to them. Or you can even reach out to them and just ask something that you can do is send an email, a very polite and nice one, so it doesn't get dismissed, and just ask if what you're working on could potentially be a fit for the publishing house, and maybe even ask for their recommendations. Um, I think I, oh, yeah, no, oh, no, oh. Uh, I was... oh, sorry, no, I think I have a question that like, I think everyone here can speak to, um, which is, uh, are there certain things or certain aspects or certain qualities of a writer that help them make, help make them more attractive, I guess, to a publishing house, if you were submitting? It's a weird I would question. Say, like, yeah, right. yeah, I would say, I mean, it's very individual. Like I, like, I mean, obviously if you have like a hundred thousand Twitter followers, you know, that's probably going to work in your favor, maybe. But also like, if you don't have that, there are other strengths that you have. Like I wouldn't focus on any specific quality that would like make your way easier as a writer. Like there is literally no single quality because they would probably come with um, you know, an equal amount of like flaws or something. Um, I think it's very specific and individual to the person. Um, I think that if you, depending on your goals, um, if there are certain capacities that you would like to invest in and develop, I would say um, uh, getting feedback and incorporating it into your work, your work um, like being a good listener, um, like not taking your, not being too precious about your work um, would be a good quality to develop. Um, being able to speak about your work confidently and clearly, um, this doesn't mean necessarily, you know, going up on CBC and being like, oh, I wrote the best book and here's what it's about. I mean, like if you're in a pitch meeting with agents and publishers, or if your, your agent brings you to, um, to talk uh, TV rights or film rights um, with like a production company, like you need to be at that table and be able to confidently and clearly say, this is what my work is about. It's really meaningful to me because of this. And here's why I think it's really exciting and why I would like to work with you on it. Like if you can do that, um, that's a transferable skill in so many different environments, but it's not necessarily like a quality that's like inherent to a person that's gonna make them you know, a sure bet for a publisher, but these are our capacities um, that if you don't have them yet, it might be a good idea to work on. Uh, to build on that, something that I hear a lot just in my other, uh, uh, my other role as just a program manager, and also what I've been told as a writer is that um, demonstrating a commitment to your work, so demonstrating, so even if you don't have um, books published because another thing with me too, is that before I got Frank Planted published, I didn't really have that many um, that, I didn't really have uh, short stories published in different magazines or anything like that. In fact, for all four years that I was at uh, U of T, Hart House rejected me each time. Um, so, so, you know, um, I didn't really have like um, 
a publishing history before Frying Planton, but I had done things that made it known that I was very passionate and very serious about creative writing. I took my courses. Um, I did have my MFA, but uh, I did internships. I did anything that I possibly could to show that I was actually interested in creative writing as a career, in writing as a career, in being an author. So if you have your own workshops, if you have your own like uh, writing groups, if you if you have your own book clubs or anything that suggests that you really love what you do and you're really committed to what you do, that's something that will absolutely um, translate, I think. Um, and I think another thing is also to really make it clear that you see your interaction with any publisher, like you see it as a relationship, that it isn't a transaction, that you know exactly why your work fits with them and that's what you're demonstrating often especially if you don't have an agent and your submission is unagented um and it's basically just going into a massive pile that somebody is going to be reading through you want to stand out and you need your work a to stand out for itself but often i know that well you have some questions with cover letters but just to make sure that Again, you really know what the publisher is looking for. You make that clear and you demonstrate that fit. And you also show that, you know, you don't see it as a one-off thing that you, like you're looking for a home for your work and you don't see it as one book you see beyond that. Um, and it's also something that's mutually beneficial both for you and for the publisher. I think those are... I think these are all good answers. I think a lot of writers that I know like really worry about like, oh, I, I don't have like an award for this. So I don't have the short story in this magazine. So I can't, no publisher would want to look at me. So this is really helpful, especially to like writers in the audience who might not have a lot of uh, previous publications. Um, so uh, my next question is, um, I think I'm going to give this one to Tally. It's the one about uh, poetry publishing and poetry book publishing. I know Coach House publishes poetry. So can you maybe speak a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, oh, I feel like I'm just like a parrot saying the same thing all the time. Um, but sorry, what is the specific question about publishing poetry? Is it about so? Uh, the the question was, uh, could the panelists give some insight on book on poetry book publishing uh, in particular? Any advice? So just something like general. Um, okay. Any advice for publishing poetry? Okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't really say anything new, but again, okay, no, you know what? I am gonna say something new. Aside from knowing where you're submitting and what the publishers publish and on and on knowing their catalog. Um, with poetry especially, I think that a lot of writers don't realize just how many options that they have and that there is of course um, publishers that will publish a full length manuscript, but you can also publish a chat book. You can publish, um, you can publish, a series of short poems in a pamphlet like there's and there's micro presses that you can submit to so it isn't just um large publishing houses and then independent presses but there's micro presses that do that kind of work as well and it's so great for poetry because there's just so many different options and a lot of them are not in the mainstream so when i talk about doing your research in this case i realize that with poetry you you can definitely find a home for your work. You're just going to have to get very creative about where you look. Um, and if anyone has specific questions about poetry or wants to talk about what those options are, then you're welcome to send me an email and we can chat. Another really interesting question um, that I think might be helpful for like people who are looking for publishers um, is how to gauge the repeatability of publishers. Like how do you know like what a good publisher is or things like that? Uh, Azalika. Uh, okay, for me, it was kind of like what we were saying in terms of research, in terms of looking at the books that they publish. First of all, looking at whether or not they publish the kinds of books that you like to read. So like one thing that everybody kind of says, but which actually is very helpful, find your favorite book, look who the publisher is, look at that publisher, um, see what they see what they're doing in terms of reputability. For me, that again was, um, I was at a stage where I actually just emailed the authors who were published by these publishers, just being like, so sorry if this sounds kind of weird. I know that you don't really know me, um, but I just, you know, I'm, I'm just doing research and I just kind of want to know what your experience is like dealing with these, um, with this publisher. 
And every time someone responded to me and told me some good things and told me some not so good things. Um, and so I think, I mean, I definitely absolutely think that you should respect people's times and respect people's place, uh, space and, and everything like that and don't hound someone. But I do think that there is the ability to actually just reach out and contact authors because they're people just like you. Um, so there isn't this kind of like, ah, I can't really like respond, like, you know, contact them or anything like that. If they don't respond back, don't like continue badgering them. But I think that there's always like, um, you can always just be like, why not? Like, why not just like send this email and see what comes from it? Um, so that's what I did. And I also just, you know, um, I didn't only just do that with, uh, with publishers. I also did, I mean, with uh, authors, I also did that with agents. At that point though, um, just because of the fact that I work at an organization that's in the sort of literary administration, I, I did have more of an in where I could just email an agent and be like, hey, by the way, what do you know about this publisher? Um, but I really feel like um, if you just type in the publisher name and just look at the books and look, if you're really into awards, see what kind of awards these books have won. If you're really into um, editing process, actually, if you Google and you go far enough into Google, you will have forums where people will discuss their uh, relationships with publishers. Like I'm sure Reddit probably has something like that. But um, for me, I think I was on like page seven of Google. And then I finally started to get like just more chatter. If you're really like, if you really want a full picture and not just kind of like the official page kind of thing, that's just something that I did. Um, so not very scientific, but I kind of just, Googled. Well, that works. Uh, Rebecca? Yeah. Google is your friend, um, but also like try and look for the, um, the, the folks in your literary community um, who are going to have the gossip. Um, ideally, like a kind of older mentor person, someone who's like, you know, who has established that they are very open to being a mentor to um, younger authors. Um, not in like a creepy way, like, but in like a, a very obvious, like, this is a, um, yeah, I have, I have some older woman in publishing who I go to when I'm dealing with situations and I can be like, hey, what's deal with this thing? And they're like, oh, yeah, let me tell you about that trash fire. Um, there are a lot of trash fires in publishing. Be mindful of them. Know that you are coming into a space where there are, you know, you know, beautiful shining Olympic flames that burn brightly and are like, you know, aspirational to all. And then there are trash fires. Like, well, let's not, let's not be dicey about it. Um, for, to identify the trash fires, like it's really helpful to find um, older mentors in the community um, who can tell you the um about the missing stairs um it's also important to listen to people in particular um other people in your cohort other emerging authors other people that are kind of like um more towards the sidelines who who have different experiences um i remember like one example where um uh, a guy i know uh was talking about his one experience with the publisher and a girl i know had a completely opposite experience with that same publisher and for me, that was a signal of like, oh, like I believe both of their experiences are real, but I now know that if I'm working with this publisher, I need to watch out because um, they will not take me as seriously because of my gender. Um, like that, that's the thing. And that is so applicable across different categories. So like know that like in terms of a publisher's reputation, you do need to do your research, um, but also know that your experience might not be the same as another person's for a variety of factors. Um, like, like if you're, if you're, you know, black or uh, first nations, like you are going to have a different experience working with the publishing community. Um, and it's going to be harder for you. Um, and it's even more important for you to find community members that can advocate for you, can mentor you. Um, I think Zulika mentioned that the, the um, the mentorship uh, that Diaspora Dialogues is doing. I know that the Writers Union of Canada has recently rolled out something. Um, 
use those resources because like you're going to need them in order to navigate an industry that's going to be harder in some ways. Um, and then just another note, especially for the independent authors, when you are self-publishing, there are uh, there are a ton of sharks um, who are out there to get you. Um, they feed on the passion and dreams of people who just want to see their book in people's hands. And um, I'm talking specifically about like predatory self-publishing services like Author Solutions, Maple Leaf, um, Agora Press. Like these are these are various places where. Um, if you've heard the adage, money flows to the author, um, like it's difficult in self-publishing sometimes because you are paying for your books to be shipped to you, like that kind of stuff. Um, you are paying for your own marketing. But when it comes to um, a service like Author Solutions or Maple Leaf where they're um, trying to convince you to do packages that include um, you know, a video, if, if anyone's trying to like guarantee you book sales or guarantee your guest spot at um, a venue like Word on the Street, they are lying to you. Um, we had to send cease and desist letters because um, folks like Author Solutions and Maple Leaf Publishing will sell packages to um, independent authors or emerging authors saying that they will get them guest spots at all of these festivals all over the world. Um, and then the author pays $5,000 for Author Solutions to set up a booth and give away 70 copies of their book. So like, it's kind of like the, the author in a box experience, but you are paying $5,000 to have 70 people read your book. And you could just do that yourself and like pay $125 or something for your own table at Word on the Street. Like, do your research, but be mindful of the fact that people that guarantee you book sales or appearances or anything like that probably don't have your best interests at heart. And it is incumbent upon you to make sure that you're not taken advantage of in those ways and to do your research. Um, Writer Beware is a great resource. And I recommend that everyone like takes a look at it regularly. Um, also, Jason uh, Something's Genre Grapevine. Um, he's on Patreon, but it's free for everyone to read. Genre Grapevine, Writer Beware, it's part of the SFWA thing, and then mentorship organizations and reaching out to other authors who may have had similar experiences to yours. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I just wanted to hear from uh, Tally um, if there's anything that um, you wanted to mention about how like writers can gauge sort of like the reputability of publishers. I feel like both Zalika and, and um, Rebecca gave very fulsome answers. I don't know if I can add anything else, but I think um, just, yeah, talk to other authors that have worked with the publishing houses. And if you hear negative experiences from enough people, take that as a sign um, for yourself. And if you hear a lot of great things, then that, just listen to the people around you. And I, I think, <laughs> All has been said and said well, so I don't need to take up time. All right, um, I have another question here. Right. I'm um, very passionate about people not being taken advantage of. Uh, no worries, that's that's good. Uh, I have a question on cover letters. Um, so um, I wanted to go to Tally first because I don't know if like reading cover letters is something that you do uh, in your job. Um, so yeah, could you just please tell us a little bit about what makes a great cover letter? I read a lot of cover letters in my job, and if you want the hard cold truth is that when people like me read hundreds and hundreds of cover letters you can very very quickly start to tell what the manuscript following is going to sound like and so the ideal situation that you want to be in is that you're in the camp of writers who has taken the time to write a cover letter. They don't send the same cover letter to all of the publishers that they're submitting to. Um, that they know the catalog of the publisher that they're submitting to. So for example, something that Coach House does is we ask for comp titles. So the reason that a lot of publishers will ask for comp titles is they want to know that the writers submitting to them, they're actually familiar with the work that they publish and they have a clear reason for wanting to publish with that publisher but also that 
you know, it's just like that extra bit of care that you take that shows that you actually see a relationship with this publisher. And it isn't that you're just dying to get your book published somewhere, anywhere. It really doesn't matter to you. So that's one thing that I would say. Um, the other thing is that your tone really matters a lot in your cover letter. Of course, you want to be confident in your work, but you also don't want to proclaim that you are the most magnificent writer in the whole entire world and you're going to sell 100,000 million copies and then everybody is going to be dying to read your book. Because what you're really doing is you're setting an incredibly high standard for yourself. And so if you are believed and then the person gets to what comes after and you don't deliver, then you know that's your own reputation that you're setting up. So writing cover letters is an art, not a skill, or maybe it's both. I don't know. The point is, is that it's complicated. It is hard. So you need to take the time to do it. You need to do it right. Really small things like make sure that when you're writing a cover letter, you're addressing it to the appropriate publisher, that you are not putting 50 publishers into the, like, you know, when you're sending an email, you're in not CC, yeah. into the CC or even in the two. Or even don't BCC a publisher and say, hey, here's my manuscript, <laughs> because then you know that it's also going to a lot of other people. Um, and then both with cover letters and with your manuscript itself, publishers put guide guidelines on their website for a reason. So make sure that you follow them. Some publishers will immediately disqualify you if your submission doesn't fit their guidelines, even if it's formatting guidelines, simply because they have so many things to read and to look at. So you just want to make sure that you're giving yourself as many opportunities to be read as possible and not to be distorted from the file. All of that is to say it's not bleak. It isn't hopeless. There are real people that are reading your work and they're reading your work because they love the work that they do and they want to see you you know, achieve your dreams. So really what a cover letter is doing is you want to put your best foot forward and give yourself as much opportunity as possible to get a positive reaction from the person that is sitting on the other side of the screen. Um, before we go on to um, other people, I wanted, we have a qu I wanted you, Tally, to like have an opportunity to talk a little bit more about Soapbox because we actually have, like we have a question about, about Soapbox uh, here. So the question is, what is your vision for Soapbox in the coming years? Will you be looking uh, to take on many more novels and get those novels into bookstores and things like that? So I just want to give you like an opportunity here to talk about Soapbox. Oh, well, thank you, Therese, and thank you so much for the question to whoever asked. Um, okay, well, my vision for the Soapbox was and always will be to give as big a platform as possible to emerging writers. So my ultimate goal is to do whatever I can to create as big a space as possible to support the writers that we do publish. Um, so... Yes. Will we be looking to take on more novels and working to get those novels into bookstores? We are currently accepting full-length manuscript submissions. My dream is to transition to focusing not exclusively but largely on full-length manuscripts and to be able to publish novels, full-length poetry collections, short story collections, um, creative nonfiction essays um, as full-length works for emerging writers. Uh, talking about the business side of publishing and the financials is a totally different conversation. So we'll get there when we get there in terms of the soapbox's capacity to be able to exclusively focus on doing full length manuscripts um, as the larger part of our publishing. Um, but yeah, I don't think I answered the question perfectly. But if you take a look at our website, you can see the work that we do. Um, every year we publish a creative writing anthology we are actually launching an anthology that we are publishing this year on Friday. It's called You've Gone Incognito, and it's all about how we engage with social media and the impact that it has on us. Um, so very excited to have that finally out into the world. Um, and then we also publish poetry chat books. So an announcement that we have not yet made to anyone that maybe I should not be doing on an event, but I'm going to do on an event, is that we just accepted two brand new poetry chat books that they're not poetry, I'm lying. Two brand new chat books that are so incredible that we'll be publishing in 2021. So all of that is to say my vision is just for us to be able to do more, to have greater capacity, um, and just to continue to supporting, to continue supporting emerging writers. Um, just you. a quick question for Tally as well. Like, so with um, Soapbox and as a publisher, can you speak a bit more about like the 
the way that the the economics of publishing works the economics of our publishing like of, a, of like you guys or coach house like just so that people have kind of a an understanding of the expectations when it comes to like advances and royalties and stuff like that because i think that demystifying that is a, yeah so two completely different things between the soapbox and the coach house so um, the soapbox were a micro press, so we are entirely self-funded. We are so small that we are not even eligible to apply for grants. The first time we'll be eligible for grants is this year. So the way that we work is that all of the money that we make, it goes right back into producing more books. Um, yeah, so we're very, very grassroots. With Coach House, it's very different where they are already established. They um, are a profitable publisher, but they also rely on grant funding. And so their funding model is very different. Um, the Soapbox, we're also at, even though we've been around for four years, we're in the early stages of what we're able to do. Um, so we're still growing what we're able to do in terms of distribution. We're still growing all of those channels and those networks, whereas um, Coach House already has all of that established. When it comes to advances, the soapbox isn't able to pay advances yet, but we are able to pay royalties. So we have royalty rates um, that are standard in the publishing industry that we offer to our writers when we take on their manuscripts. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I also have another specific question for uh, about short stories um, for Zalika. Uh, so this question says, I would like to submit short stories for publication, question mark. Um, what's the best way to do this? Is it better than trying to write a novel or should I write a novel first? Um, hmm. This is always really interesting for me to like to say because what will generally happen with most agents, which is what happens with me and with other people that I know, is that you'll be like, I have the short story. They're like, great, do you have a novel? Um, so they kind of want a two book deal where they're just like, okay, we have the short story collection over here, but you also have a novel and that could potentially make money. So if we have both, then we can like sell this to a publisher. So that's what you get, like that's what you hear a lot, but my novel wasn't ready. Um, I just had this short story collection and I managed to find an agent and a publisher that was interested in just the short story collection. Um, I went to Anansi, but I'm actually in their imprint, Astoria Press, which is only dedicated to short story collections. I think they have like three short story collections a year. So that's also, um, so that's kind of how that happened. Uh, so, I mean, I, and and when I was going through like the kind of shopping process of like frying plant in, there were a lot of people who were like, this is great. Will you turn this into a novel? And I said no, because I was very adamant in it being a short story collection, which is also something that I think that um, is, a, is advice that I would have for, for writers where you're like, definitely take feedback, definitely take edits. But if you know what you want, if you're very confident in the fact that you want your structure to be this way, then don't sway because eventually, um, even if you do have it published and it's not the book that you want, then it's not gonna be the experience that you want. So I knew that I wanted it to stay a short story collection and eventually I found um, the right home. Something else that I forgot to mention, but I'll mention now is that another way to get your work out there is actually through grants, the recommender grants from the Ontario Arts Council because they go to different publishers. So a lot of the time too, when I was, um, writing my short story collection and I would send like my store what a story in for um for uh for a grant sometimes publishers would respond to me being like if this is done please send it to us directly um and so that's another way that you get to know publishers as well as through those grants um so so even if like an agent won't take on a short story collection if you do those grants potentially even if you don't get the grant from that publisher they might want to know more about your work when it's finished so there's also different avenues to get short story collections in there personally i hope and think that there's less stigma around short story collections in canlet just because so many amazing short story collections have been published in the past few years um so uh, I've had this conversation a lot, um, just also as the program manager at Diaspora Dialogues, because we have a lot of workshops with agents and publishers um, about 
uh, publishing things. And so a lot of the people who come through the program will talk to the agents being like, I don't understand this whole thing about short story collections because short story collections clearly get sold. Like people clearly read them. So like, why do you keep saying this? So I think that there's potentially a shift in, in, in that. So. This is getting like really like nitpicky, really fine detail, but like, do you think there's a difference between like interconnected short stories, kind of like yours, where it's like one character and then like just other short stories? I don't know. You may not yeah. know. Like, I don't yeah, know. yeah. Like, I mean, okay. In terms, I'll say in terms of marketing, there's definitely a difference because a publisher will be like, it's a novel in stories. And so that like makes people, okay. they see novel, but at the same time, at least with my my marketing strategy or Nancy's marketing strategy is different. They didn't say it was a novel and they didn't say it was a short story collection. They just said frying plant in. So they were just like, oh, is it a novel or is it not? And sometimes they get reviews, which are really funny to me because they're like, this kind of reads like a short story collection. And I'm like, that's because it is a short story collection. <laughs> um, but in terms of like how, how people read it and how people um, respond to it, in terms of me, people are mostly just confused. They're just kind of like, I don't know, is this a novel? You say it's a short story, but it's like one person and it's like following this one person. And so it doesn't read like a short story collection. Um, so that's just kind of how it happened with me. I think that uh, you just like let them like do what they want. You're just like, oh, you decide for yourself if it's a- Yeah, that's, that's what they just like, they just decided to be like, I don't know, what do you guys think? Do you think it is? Do you think it's not? And 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 it's worked. Um, it's just really funny when there have been like reviews where it'd be like, yes, this is a novel. And I'm like, no, it's not. But if you think it's a novel, that's fine. Because it doesn't bother me if other people call it a novel. What bothered me was when people, when I was trying to get it out there, it's like, I want you to change the structure and the format to make it into what a conventional novel was. And I was like, I'm not doing that. This is how I wrote it. And this is how I want to keep it. So. Um, I have a like a final question for all of you because we're supposed to end at like eight fifty five, um, which is like oh, okay. for the writers for the writers here. Um, is there anything that happens during your publishing process that um, you were dissatisfied with, or anything that you regret, or anything that you just wish you could just take back, or anything like that? Um, we'll start with Rebecca. Okay, well, just quickly on the short story thing. Keep in mind that your the receptivity towards short stories varies wildly between like canlit and literary fiction versus genre. Um, in the genre community, like in science fiction and fantasy, there is a very healthy ecosystem where they are looking for short stories. Um, Augur magazine, is, which uh, Therese is the poetry editor, um, Augur pays like industry, like pro rates for short fiction um, and poems. Um, the, the whole Kenlet short story thing confuses me because, uh, yeah, like there's this whole thing where you have to pay to submit to various magazines, um, and then you get, if your story is chosen, then you get paid. But in the science fiction and fantasy worlds, um, you submit and then you get like, you know, 10 cents a word. So like, just keep in mind that like, based on like what you're writing, um, like short stories do have like, like I'm a terrible short story writer. I have not published a single short story. I'm very, very bad at them. Um, but science fiction and fantasy, so many short stories. If there was one thing that I regret about my publishing process, it is that I'm not a stronger uh, short story writer who could have used that avenue to um, you know, market my work a bit better. But no, really in terms of like my, my journey as uh, an independently published author, um, I think one of my biggest things was not, um, was focusing so much on the writing and like the distribution um, that I didn't do as much early on in the series to um, build a community around the books or to market myself outside of the, the familiar avenues. Um, if I could go back, I would have approached reviewers much earlier. Um, I would have submitted my uh, writing for my books for contests. Um, I would have discovered that I was actually eligible for grants a lot earlier um, or like the process of how to become eligible uh, because that's what's made all of the work on my, my current projects so possible is um, being able to access the support of uh, the Toronto Arts Council, the Canadian Council for the Arts, um, Patreon, like 
being able to build a variable uh, income stream to support that work so that I'm not, you know, transcribing news stories at 10 p.m. at night at Queen's Park, um, that kind of stuff. So like setting myself up and, and knowing that I could bet on myself a lot earlier um, would have been like helpful. Uh, Zalika? Um, for me, I mean, it's most, I think for me, it's just mostly um, not, not something that I regret, but something that was, was a little tiring was like when I was mentioning before going back and forth with my editor in terms of line edits and trying to like explain different cultural expectations and why certain things are written a certain way. That's really tiring to do. Um, generally my editing process was very smooth and it was very done and they listened to my comments, but it's just that, that extra thing of trying to explain to people who aren't black or aren't Jamaican why certain things are written a certain way. It's just, um, you know, when you are writing certain things and when you are black or you are a person of color, that's just an extra thing that you potentially will have to deal with. Um, because I was with my stories for so long and because the feedback I was getting wasn't anything new, I was very adamant in what I was keeping and what I wasn't keeping. Um, and so luckily I was able to stand my ground. I know a few writers because they were so happy um, to get published that they didn't really fight their editors on certain things. And not that they regret their books or anything like that, but there are certain things where they're just kind of like, oh, I wish that I was like more, I stood my ground on certain things about that more. So it's just that kind of process was, was kind of um, difficult. The one thing I didn't stand my, dan grant, my, my grant, uh, stand my ground on was the cover. I love the cover of my book. It's a great cover. It's not the right cover because the green is supposed to be more um, prominent because they wanted to go for uh, the jaw colors, which is yellow, red, and green. And I remember I was being very timid about that where I was just like, um, there should be like more green. And they like bolded the green part, which is like my Paul Beatty quote, like a little bit more, just being like, look, there's green. And I was like, okay. Um, and so <laughs> that's just something, <laughs> just like a little more, that's just something where if I look at my cover, I'm like, I love my cover, but this is like correct. Um, so that's probably like my one thing where I'm just like, I probably could have bought them a little bit more on my cover. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it. And Tally, anything, any regrets? Anything you're dissatisfied with? Um, well, I, you mean in terms of like the books I've published of others? Oh, sure. Yeah, if that, if that applies. Um, I, no, I don't think that's a good question for me to answer, but just something that has been going on in my head is just from that short story question. Can I answer that? Can I just yeah. make a comment on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, just going back to um, the question about should, um, instead of writing a short story, would it be better to work on a novel? I just, for so many years, I just see that idea of it's easier to write a short story than it is to write a novel. And just that hierarchy of the way things work, that is so wrong. And that is not how you look at things. I will never forget a class that I took in my undergrad. It was, um, I think it was, anyways, doesn't matter the course, I'm not going to spend time trying to remember it. But the professor said that writing a short story is infinitely harder than writing a novel because you have so little space to say what you want to say where in a short story every single word counts whereas in a novel you can fudge up the beginning or the middle or even the end doesn't have to be perfect but there are so many there's so much more space for other redeeming qualities that it's okay where a short story is tight and it basically has to be perfect if you're aiming for like you know a short story is not easier. So I think we should all value the short story, appreciate the short story, Zalika, amazing. <laughs> um, and then the same thing goes for poets. So when you're writing, just make sure you're not writing for what you think is more desirable, but rather than you write what you write and then afterwards you will deal with where you're going to place it. I think that uh, that is an excellent uh, idea to end on. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for coming to this How to Get Published event. I'm going to bring back Emily for some final uh, comments. And thank you to Rez. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you to everybody. Um, wow, I just 
I'm so happy with this event. It's always so amazing to hear all of your opinions. Um, and so on behalf of the Hart House Literary and Library Committee, even if, you know, got rejected from <laughs> the Hart House Review, um, I, I wasn't responsible for it back then. <laughs> I'm still not responsible for it. But yes, on behalf of the Hart House Literary and Library Committee, we'd like to thank all of you. Um, and we'd like to thank everybody who came out to this event, who, you know, um, asked questions. Um, it, you know, it was great to sort of hear your opinions on just like this wide variety of topics. Um, and I know that like, as a university student, it's always something that's really, really helpful. So uh, yes, I'm going to leave the Zoom call on for a little bit, I guess, if you want to linger. Um, but thank you for coming out tonight. I hope you have a good rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, if anyone wants to get in touch and if you have more questions, um, you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at, at kthanksbex, K-T-H-N-X-B-E-X, -E or just search for Becca DM. Um, and yeah, and when you are writing and submitting your work, and um, if you do have a book that you've published, uh, you know, submit your work to the word on the street, because we are always so excited to support emerging and first time authors. Um, like, we love it. We're going to change the face of Canlet together. So let's do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, get in touch if you have any questions, especially if you have questions about like keeping your receipts and filing expenses and, you know, submitting your T2125 forms at tax time. Because like if you are calling yourself a writer, Therese, you should be keeping your receipts and submitting them as eligible expenses against your taxes every year, even if you don't have a book out yet. And I feel very strongly about this. So hit me up on Twitter. I've opened up the chat. So if you wanted to put it in the chat um, for everybody, but yes, um, you can also attend our supplementary event to this, how to find a literary agent um, in probably March of next year. If we survive that long, we'll see you for that. And you can learn even more. Um, but yeah, if you'd like, if you guys would like to put any of your information in the chat, please feel free to do that. I'm just going to leave my email in the chat because although I'm on social media, I just need a break from it. So I'm much happier over email. So I'm just going to leave that there. I'm going to put my IG and my uh, website um, IG just because I'm more active on Instagram than I am on Twitter and my website, there's a contact form um, and you can send questions, anything like that through there. Thank you. Oh, make sure you in the chat, you put it to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Salika yours is only to me at this point. <laughs> the one bad thing about Zoom is that you can't copy and paste messages. <laughs> Yay! I love seeing people's things that I love seeing like the thing that I miss the most about not doing this event in person is that last year there were so many people that were able to come up and be like hey I'm working on this hey I'm writing this and it was so exciting so like mm -hmm. um yeah for everyone else if you're working on something say hi in the chat like I'm happy to stick around and say hello to folks yes definitely as long as everybody here is comfortable uh staying around for a little bit uh, I'm gonna actually go because okay. <laughs> I have to do other work. Uh, oh, yeah. So thank you again, Emily, for inviting me. I'm always happy to come and mm -hmm. do cool things with the Lit Lib Committee. Um, thanks to Matthew as well. You're, I'm sure you're there. Okay, oh, hey, what's up? Uh, see you at the board of steers meeting. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, have a good night, uh, everybody. Um, I'll